So uh, next, we'll introduce uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Rob Venick, who is a hepatologist here at UCLA. He's a pediatric hepatologist, but um, he also uh, is a subspecialty consultant for us uh, in the adult congenital heart disease program. And this is, I think, a good example, the relationship we have with, with Dr. Venick of uh, the kind of multidisciplinary um, cross-departmental uh, collaboration that's needed in order to have a uh, successful ACHD program. So Dr. Venix is going to talk to us about uh, Fontaine liver. Uh, thank you and good morning everybody. Um, it is truly a pleasure to be here. Uh, I don't have any disclosures. Uh, I'd just like to say on a professional level I have great respect for all of you in the room, uh, the cardiologists, cardiothoracic surgeons, the intensivists, and on a personal level, I have nothing but gratitude towards teams uh, here who care for these patients and feel privileged to be a part of this. Um, Dr. Abelhausen and I uh, participated in a meeting uh, at the Hart House a little bit over a year ago, and some of what we'll cover in the next 15 minutes uh, has to do with some guidelines that will be forthcoming uh, and uh, are in the process of uh, publication. So these are the topics that I'd like to cover, kind of the pathophysiology, why uh, patients with uh, Fontan physiology develop uh, Fontan-associated liver disease, some of their symptomatology, kind of highlight the importance of early identification and risk stratification for these patients, talk about ways that we monitor and screen them and pitfalls in our current technology, and then therapeutic options from a liver perspective. And uh, just uh, we'll close with some of the limitations and limited data uh, with combined heart liver transplant. Uh, so normal liver physiology uh, is such that the portal vein provides the majority of the blood flow into the liver. And at the microvascular level, the blood circulates through the liver via sinusoids. Normal pressure um, in the sinusoids uh, for most of us uh, hopefully is around five millimeters of mercury. In patients uh, with Fontan physiology, and Dr. Lin, I thought, uh, and previous speakers have done a great job of highlighting just the, the sheer number of patients as cardiac and cardiothoracic care has improved. A number of these patients are cer certainly reaching adulthood, and then this recognition of Fontan associated liver disease has certainly emerged. And I think the two driving factors or common um, underlying problems here why a patient would develop Fontan associated liver disease have to do with elevated central venous pressures. We heard a little bit about this problem with non-pulsatile flow um, and a passive congestion in the liver. And then the second just being kind of this chronic underperfusion or a, a chronic uh, hypoperfusion of the liver as a result of decreased cardiac output. So uh, under the microscope, what that translates into is that the sinusoids become dilated. This uh, you can sort of appreciate in the central part of this low power slide. Uh, there are a number of red blood cells kind of congest congested in here, and this would we would see a much sort of tighter sinusoidal picture here uh, in, in, in a normal liver biopsy. The other thing that really stands out and makes this quite interesting to hepatologists is that congestive hepatopathy really lacks inflammation that we see throughout almost all other forms of liver disease, whether it's viral hepatitis or non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or alcoholic liver disease. So a lot of this uh, is um, very interesting to us from a, a study standpoint and, and, and I think also uh, highlights the fact that the therapeutic um, measures for these patients are often different than for, other, for patients with other forms of liver disease who develop cirrhosis. Uh, over time, what this uh, concept of chronic congestion can lead to is scarring in the liver, and that's highlighted in this trichrome stain. The blue is essentially collagen or, 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 or fibrosis uh, deposition. This tends to start in the sinusoids and then tends to, to expand towards the, the, the central veins, and when it becomes 
uh, bridging from one central vein to the next. We're sort of kind of in a pre serotic uh, state uh, from a histology perspective. How this translates uh, clinically is that many of these patients are actually, in a good way, in 2017 discovered as we're screening for them. So this may be incidentally on laboratories or imaging. Um, clinical manifestations may include hepatomegaly, an end-stage uh, liver disease patient with uh, a failed Fontan, uh, occasionally may have a shrunken liver, although that's a lot less common uh, as the liver becomes cirrhotic. Uh, ascites is, is often uh, not uncommon, and some of that may have to do with protein losing enteropathy as well. Uh, portal hypertension manifests by splenomegaly, uh, low cell counts, uh, low platelet and, and white blood cell counts in particular, uh, esophageal varices, and then this, this risk or, or development potentially over time of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is something that can occur with any form of chronic liver disease. Uh, hepatic encephalopathy and impaired uh, synthetic liver function, uh, i.e. coagulopathy, are more advanced and unfortunately less common in this population than in other uh, forms of chronic liver disease. When we are seeing these patients in clinic in a multidisciplinary fashion, one of the very important points is how far out is a patient from their Fontan? We have good data uh, from multiple um, ACHD centers around the country that the further out one is, in approaching 20 plus years, you see the odds ratio of developing Fontan-associated liver disease uh, continues to, to, to climb. Uh, along those same lines, we see patients that are 30 plus years out from their Fontan who have very little liver disease and perhaps uh, their cardiac function, as shown in some series, may be uh, better than, than other patients. So those are two kind of uh, important ways to stratify risk of developing Fontan-associated liver disease. Ways that we can screen for this, um, we mentioned laboratories and we'll look uh, in a little more detail at that, uh, imaging, uh, biopsy, and then this is really how the field of hepatology is moving to, to non-invasive biomarkers and, and uh, there are uh, some, some very interesting and exciting uh, biomarkers. I think it's uh, fair to say that in this population, uh, none of these are validated, at least in large numbers, and there are some scoring systems, and we'll highlight just a couple of those towards the end of the talk. I wanted to show this. This would be kind of a typical laboratory profile. It's a relatively small uh, a, a paper here, but very representative of patients uh, who are 10 to 15 years out from Fontan, which are the, the, the main abnormalities we see are a mild elevation, uh, typically in AST or ALT, and then the GGT, which we like, uh, uh, like a, uh, or prefer over alkaline phosphatase. Uh, those are the two that stand out. Um, uh, the major the, uh, most of these, though, are relatively mild. Uh, and um, I think another important uh, point is that many of the patients who are on Coumadin, uh, looking at their INR as a, a measure of liver synthetic function is not something that we can utilize. So we may look at fibrinogen or factor V or factor VII levels. Albumin, because of PL PLE issues, may also be difficult to gauge. Um, the thing or the limitation with laboratories is that it does not do a good job, as you can sort of appreciate here, in differentiating cirrhotic patients from non cirrhotic patients. And that's uh, a theme throughout the, the, the panel of liver function tests. Uh, along those uh, uh, same lines, not only is there a cor poor correlation with biopsy proven cirrhosis, but over time, these laboratories don't tend to move in, in a common direction where we grade fibrosis from zero to four, with four being cirrhosis, and we really don't see, as you, you can appreciate here, even with small numbers, we don't appreciate a change over time in, in numbers. So while the uh, liver function tests, and we do follow these uh, uh, periodically, uh, tell us some information, they certainly have uh, limitations. One of the, uh, liver one of the uh, laboratories that we also will follow in patients 10 plus years out from their Fontan is alpha fetoprotein. And alpha fetoprotein is a decent but very limited marker for screening for hepatocellular carcinoma. Uh, this is, uh, has its limitations in very small uh, malignant lesions in the liver and not being able to detect those. 
uh, and it also uh, has limitations in fibro lamellar variants. And then, of course, uh, up to 20% of patients with HCC may not produce uh, alpha feta protein. So having said that, again, this is something that we can follow and maybe follow within an individual patient over time to look at their trends. Uh, but uh, you know, what's the optimal cutoff point in this population and the sensitivity and specificity is certainly something that we still need more data on. So that then brings us to imaging. And listed here are kind of uh, the three major modalities of imaging, ultrasound, CT scan, or MRI. If you ask a hepatologist, if you're seeing a patient with a failing Fontan, which modality would you prefer? It'd be an MRI and be an MRI with EOVIS contrast. That's a, a means of differentiating focal nodules and evaluating for uh, focal nodular hyperplasia versus hepatocellular carcinoma. But that's not practical for everybody. Uh, ultrasound certainly has its benefits, as shown here, non-invasive, cost-effective, et cetera, but very limited based on a patient's volume status. A dual-phase CT, I have to be very cognizant of another uh, complication that we heard a little bit about, which is nephropathies in these patients. And then the MRI, uh, again, some of these patients with hardware and pacemakers may not be practical. So uh, imaging also has its uh, limitations in that it tends to overestimate degree of fibrosis. If you uh, looked at this multi-center study of 50 plus Fontan patients over 15 years out from their Fontan, uh, over half of them were described radiographically as cirrhotic and up to 20% of them have these focal nodules that we discussed. Now, 40% of the patients who are biopsied have less fibrosis than was estimated on imaging, so we, we know that, we appreciate that, uh, that the, the imaging may overcall a lot of these things. Our field is trying to move towards non-invasive ways of uh, grading uh, fibrosis, and elastography, both in ultrasound and MR, um, has become uh, sort of a, a, a very commonly uh, ordered test and very useful in following patients with viral hepatitis and, and NASH. But unfortunately, in this population, it's very limited. Uh, elastography is by uh, central venous pressures, and uh, we don't have great correlations with degree of fibrosis uh, with this uh, imaging modality. Uh, imaging, as we said, can be useful to look at these lesions, and I, I won't really go into that but in more detail, but when we see them, oftentimes we'll discuss with our radiologists and look at our degree of suspicion and say, is there a lesion there that needs to be biopsied? Has it changed over time? Does it have suspicious features? And then we'll uh, kind of rely on IR-guided biopsies if there is such, such a lesion. So that brings us to biopsy. Uh, we can use biopsy to go after these targeted focal lesions. Uh, but biopsy of liver in general, and we do this jointly oftentimes in the cath lab under the same anesthesia. Um, if a patient has ascites uh, or a coagulopathy, that may need to be done by interventional radiology, but biopsy is really our gold standard for staging fibrosis, which is a very important point in the long-term management of these patients, whether it means changes in their cardiac care or movement towards uh, transplantation. Uh, in terms of treatment for cardiogenic fibrosis, uh, just in broad uh, themes, and you all could speak much better to optimizing cardiac function than I, uh, but um, from a liver standpoint, uh, we talk and advise patients about avoidance of a second hit to the liver. So uh, moderate or, or, or abstinence from alcohol, um, f uh, good weight loss, nutrition, exercise, that can be challenging in this uh, patient population. Uh, avoiding other uh, medications that can potentially lead to drug-induced liver injury, uh, screening for viral hepatitis, making sure our patients are immunized. For those who uh, had cardiothoracic surgery before the early 90s when blood banks were screened well for hep C, uh, the use of direct-acting antivirals, which offer uh, a great op uh, chance for cure for uh, hepatitis C uh, these days. Um, and, and then really managing complications of Fontan-associated liver disease. And so we have really uh, solid guidelines for other forms of chronic liver disease from the American Association of the Study of Liver Disease. For portal hypertension, for example, uh, we know when we uh, ought to screen these patients with endoscopy, put them on medications such as beta blockers or isosorbide dinitrate. Um, 
there are not such clear guidelines in the fail, failing Fontan population. We do think that the prevalence of varices uh, in this population uh, is up to 20%, but of course that depends on how far out uh, patients are. Uh, we, we also think that bleeding from varices is less common in this uh, patient population than in other forms of chronic liver disease. Uh, so it really needs to be an individualized decision. It's hard to make a blanket statement in terms of endoscopy and so forth. Uh, uh, for uh, these patients. Ascites management, same things. We have very good guidelines for other forms of cirrhosis. A first-line treatment for uh, cirrhotic uh, patients with ascites would be sodium restriction and diuretics, but again, those decisions may, need to be made in a multidisciplinary fashion based on patient volume status and, and, and cardiac condition and so forth. Paracentesis is something that can be offered. TIPS has a very limited role, oftentimes because of uh, abnormal anatomy in these uh, uh, patients. And then hepatic encephalopathy, not something that we see as prevalent in this uh, group of patients versus other forms of cirrhosis, but I think rifaximin is uh, the medication that would be our drug of choice for the, these patients because you don't see the volume changes or electrolyte disturbances that one would see with the use of lactulose and then limits, limitations in uh, uh, protein intake. HCC treatment, I won't belabor this, but Bottom line, we have uh, guidelines of when we do have patients with focal HCC, and those guidelines are based on the size and the number of lesions and can incorporate resection, transplantation, RFA, TACE, and, and medications such as serafinib. And then finally, just to wrap up with our scoring system, we know that if we kind of look at do patients have varices, ascites, splenomegaly, and thrombocytopenia, and we give each of those a point. Patients with vast scores uh, greater than two, as shown here, uh, and this has been validated by other single centers, have higher risks of developing hepatocellular carcinoma, requiring transplant, or uh, uh, succumbing to their disease. Uh, the same thing, there's the MELD, with the exception of the INR, so the MELD score is used to uh, prioritize patients awaiting liver transplant, and it incorporates bilirubin, creatinine, and INR. If you take the INR out of that, because for many of these patients they're anticoagulated, we know that MELD scores have predictive value in the need for heart transplantation or in mortality risks for these patients. Uh, so there's some uh, non-invasive biomarkers shown here. I think all of these need further investigation, but the FibroSure panel may be the one that uh, we're most excited about, and that incorporates alpha-2 microglobulin and apolipoprotein A1, as well as LFTs. Uh, so uh, I think uh, finally with transplantation, all that I would highlight is that we really have somewhat limited data from 87 to 2010. You can see 90 plus thousand liver transplants, 67,000 heart transplants, and 97 combined heart livers. In the past seven years, that number is more than doubled in our country, so this is becoming more of an issue here at UCLA. Within the last five years, we've transplanted a number of combined patients. Uh, these patients if selected properly, can do quite well at the five-year mark. Um, they often are in their 30s or 40s and have five-year survival approaching 70%. Um, many of them have kidney uh, issues going into transplant uh, that need to be carefully screened and monitored for, and the inclusion of the liver may offer uh, an immunologic benefit for the heart outcome. So again, with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Jamil, and have a wonderful day.